a fabulous and fantastic Friday morning here on Whispering Hope. You may ask the question, why? Because the Sabbath is drawing near. You know, and every Friday I talk about this wonderful time we spend with God, these 24 hours that are so rejuvenating. We can't do anything else but give God our highest praise. And today in the house, we have Dr. Pastor Waynos, who will help us to dig deeper into our lesson. And I'm using a term that he has in his book scripture memories and we're getting all excited because you're going to hear more about it you're going to see the book review that we're going to do on this book next week and i promise you it's a book that every single person needs to have in their library it helps us to grow spiritually and there's some practical advice there's some activities not only for you but for the entire family that can be done in helping us to concretize god's words not only in our head but also in our hearts but today is about our lesson study but i just want to let you know what's happening here on whispering hope and so pastor knows we want to invite you to greet all of whispering hope and then we're going to jump into our discussion after your prayer well good morning morning to everyone rise and shine it's the end of a brand new week and we look forward for the sabbath hours in a few hours to come pray that god will certainly bless you on this friday the eve of the week let's bow our heads as we pray father we thank you so much for the opportunity to open your word because in your word we find hope we find life we find opportunity we find the possibility of a brand new relationship with you be with us bless us open our minds to receive your word in jesus name we pray amen amen the mystery of the gospel and every week i ask this question and i always i'm always intrigued by your response when you explain the topic so go right ahead dr knows the mystery of the gospel what is, is just about it tell me yeah, it is an interesting topic. The I like to look at what the author is emphasizing, then I'll answer the question about the mystery. The, the topic is the mystery of the gospel, but the emphasis, the bolded section is the gospel. What can be so mysterious about the gospel? We must therefore understand the word mystery. And mystery has to do with something that is difficult or impossible to understand or explain. So at one point, this thing seems impossible. This thing about the gospel was impossible or it was not possible for certain groups of people. And when we get into the lesson, we will identify who these groups of people were that the gospel was not accessible to and now is more than accessible to them so that's the mystery of the gospel it was mysterious but it's no longer mysterious again all right so we're going to jump into our memory text for this week it comes from ephesians 3 verses 20 and verses 21 from the new international version it says now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Tell us, what's your understanding, Doc? Well, the passage speaks of God's ability to do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine. That's how much his power is. And sometimes we take that for granted as we put all these structures and rules and systems. God's ability, you know, supersedes many of these things. And so especially when it comes to the structures of the world, whatever God desires can break down barriers, break down walls. And we will see how these work with the systems that existed. With the Gentile world, the heathen, they were one time without God. Now God opens up that doorway. The Gentiles, the Jews considered them unsavable, but now that opening has come. So sometimes the structures and the traditions around us we use them to confine us, and we also use them to confine God. And Paul is saying <laughs> here that now, and, and that is a very important word, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him be glory in the church 
and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. So there's good news, there's hope that there is no limitations to what the gospel can do for any sinner, regardless of their nationality, whether Jew or Gentile, Greek or, or, or Roman, it really doesn't matter. The gospel breaks down every barrier. Praise God for that. And every time I look at this text, I see God being able to do anything and everything. And too many times in our Christian walk, we limit just what God can do. You know, he says, if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can tell the mountains to be removed. That's you know, cool. but interestingly, on the Friday, coming from LNG White Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald, October 1, 1889, LNG White asks some very pointed question. She says, do we really believe the Bible? Do we really believe that we may attain to the knowledge of God that is presented before us in this text? Do we believe every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God? Do we believe the words that have been spoken by prophets and apostles, by Jesus Christ, who is the author of all light and blessings, and in whom dwelleth all richness and fullness? Do we really believe in God and in his Son? Mm -hmm. And that really struck at me, you know, because we can have a nominal faith. You know, I just believe certain things because I come to church, but it's not something that comes from within. There's no connection. I just show up to church every week, you know, because it may be a status symbol. Oh, you know, she's married to the pastor. So, you know, that makes her somebody. But when you really think about it, do we believe the things that we preach? Do we really believe thus said the Lord? And that's a very interesting way to open up our discussion. So we'll begin right there, Dr. Norris. We struggle sometimes with our beliefs. How do we get to the point where we accept these words as thus said the Lord? Well, it's evidence. The good thing about the Bible it doesn't begin with human beings. It begins with the evidence of the power of the word. In the beginning was God. Then God spoke. And the words brought things into existence long before us. So there's evidence of the power of the word. And so that is why faith is evidence. The evidence is all around us. That when God says something, it will come to pass. So what that does it tells us if God can do this for by speaking and something happen, if he can do this for those who have gone on before us, then this is something I can try for myself. That's what the Bible says. All oh, taste and see mm -hmm. that the Lord is good. So we have to reach out in faith as well based on the, the evidence that has been produced. And that is how we will say, Yes, this is enough evidence for me to believe, or let me try it first, and then I believe. And we see that model in the Gospels. The first three Gospels say you must have faith, and then there's healing. But John's Gospel, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all declare faith first. But in John's Gospel, faith comes as a result of God's action. So it goes both ways. I can look at the experience of someone and I develop faith, or I can develop faith out of trying God and seeing for myself. So either way, we can develop faith. Amen. So we jump into our discussions for today, and we ask to do some comparison, some comparative analysis on Paul's doxology in Ephesians 3, verse 20 and 21, and to the other doxologies in the New Testament. And I'm just going to read them so that we can have the discourse and so that our loyal viewers can follow along. So let's begin by reading our memory text. Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let me read Romans 11, 33 to 36. Oh, the depth of riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. 
How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor or who has first given to him all and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and to him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. And then Romans 16, 25 to 27 says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith, to God alone wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Philippians 4.20 says, Now to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Second Peter 3.18 says, But go in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. And Jude, verses 24 and verse 25 says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. And so I've read quite a few texts for you. And so you ask to compare these doxologies and tell us what themes or ideas move through these passages. Well, what jumps out is really the the immensity of God, how great he is in every area, in wisdom, in grace, in love, in mercy. And uh, the common thing that we see here is that because of his greatness in all these areas, glory belongs to him. He deserves our glory. So we see that common theme because of his goodness and mercy and love and greatness in all these areas, every one of these passages speaks to the fact that we should glorify his name. And to, to glorify really means to, as we use in our colloquial language, to big up God, all right? We usually say, you know, we big up somebody, and that's what glorifying is about. So it's important that we recognize that God always deserves our glory. And all of these passages, and, and this is Paul writing in these passages. So it's really showing that Paul recognizes that God desire, deserves our highest honor, our highest praise, and our highest gratitude. And that's what glory is about, the highest of everything. It may be physical, it may be spiritual, it may be animate or inanimate. But God des deserves the highest, the loudest praise, the most silent praise, just the highest and the greatest in everything God deserves. Praise God. Now, how might we adopt the attitude of praise and worship they illustrate? You just talk about giving God our highest praise. How might we adopt this attitude of praise and worship that these passages illustrate? Well, attitude speaks to our mindset. And when we come to God, we should always have that same mindset, that attitude of God is bigger than us. God is greater than us. He is unlimited in every area of his life. In his goodness, he's unlimited. In his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. And because of that, we should always come with an attitude of praise because he is unlimited. But we are limited and oftentimes woefully limited. And so when we compare ourselves to God, we're always in need of him. And the good thing is he can't run out. He cannot run out of his wisdom, his grace, his mercy. He's always at the peak. You know, when something is replenished, his doesn't need to be replenished because he's always full. And you, God. you remember the story of the wedding at Cana? When you dip and you, uh, as soon as the cup comes out, it's still full. It's not that it's going down and then full back up. When they dip the barrel, 
is still full. And that's how God's grace and his immensity functions. He's never at a point where he has less than maximum, right? He doesn't need to replenish. It's just there. It's, it's just self-replenishable, so to speak. But it doesn't go down. So that's why I'm trying not to use the word replenish. Because it doesn't go down. It just always have maximum capacity. So when we see ourselves and our need and our inadequacies, we must have an attitude of praise to God and worship to God because of how awesome he really is. Indeed, God is wonderful, awesome. He's just great. You know, we can't even find enough words in the English language to describe him. You know, and he deserves our praise. You know, and so we are doing some high order thinking today for this discussion. Again, we're going back to compare Paul's four uses of the Greek word pleroma, or fullness, as found in Ephesians 1, 10 and 23. Ephesians 3, 19 and Ephesians 4, 13. So again, I'm going to read this text for you. And then I'm going to ask you, why do you think this idea is important to Paul? So let's read. Ephesians 1, 10 says, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. And Ephesians 1, 23 says, Which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians 3, 19 says, To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And Ephesians 4, 13 says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so why do you think this idea is important to Paul, this fullness or pleroma? It's a, yeah, it's an interesting concept. I rather like the the other meaning of it, which is completeness. It's two meanings, really, the Greek brings out. And the first one is completeness. The second is full. So when we think of full, some people are full, but they still want to eat more, right? But the fullness here is fullness to completion. And that is why Paul is using this word over and over again, because when he, when he speaks of fullness of time, it's really full to capacity, it's complete. So there's no more to add to it. That's Ephesians 1 and verse 10. That's the only time it refers to time. But all the other uses are fullness in him, like verse 23 of Ephesians 1, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Christ is complete in himself. There's no limitations. And we do not need more than what he can offer. There is nothing we can say that, you know, God lacks anything. So when he comes to us, he can more than fill us to the overflowing. So he, this fullness that pleroma means yeah. has to do with completeness. So you're full to completion. And so when the question is asked, why Paul has been using this is because he wants us to see that with all the grandeur and the glory, the reason why he's worshiping God and praising God because of his immensity, his immensity comes in completeness there's no limit to oh, what wow. he brings to the table and so we can trust him we can give ourselves to him we can have faith in him we, it's more than money in the bank it's money it's treasures in heaven so to speak praise god now this whole week we've looked at ephesians chapter three and truly we don't have the time to go over all those texts i'm just going to ask you a question of all the actions of God that Paul prays in Ephesians 3, which is most inspiring to you and why? I think the whole idea of the mystery of the gospel, it's, it's kind of foreign to us because we have it. Uh, but a few thousand years ago, or uh, over 2,000 years ago, when Christ said, I chose you and not them, it made a big difference. 
we, the children of Israel were considered the chosen generation, the chosen people of God, not the others. Not that God didn't love them, but they were not chosen. It says many are called, few are chosen. So that concept of God having a special relationship with the children of Israel that is superior to the others, that is foreign to us today. We grapple. The atheists say God is bad-minded. You know, God is compartmentalizing his, his love and this kind of thing. But when we understand that the wages of sin is death, if God chose to save one, he would have done more than enough. And to know that he chose a nation and have that nation taking the gospel to the rest of the world so that all can be saved. That is an abundance of love. And it's such a privilege to know that what was not that accessible is now accessible. And that's what jumps out at me as Paul praises God that the mystery of the gospel, what was impossible for the Gentiles is now possible. So it's no longer a mystery. We being born, we, we are from the Gentile stock. Mm -hmm. We being born in the Western world from African descent. And many would debate whether Israel was in Africa and all that. But we who were not from Israel, so to speak, we weren't born there. We have the gospel. And so it's no longer a mystery. So the force of this passage doesn't weigh on us until we go back in history to realize that the Gentiles were not a part of the commonwealth. We are now grafted in among them. We are now given that privilege. Jesus said to the woman at the well, salvation is of the Jews. This is the source I have. This is the, my central location for it. You have to come here to get it. And when we understand that historical context, it really helps us to appreciate what we have today that they, many did not have. So it's a privilege to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise God. You know, as you were explaining that, it was riveting in my mind just how God loves us, eh? Indeed. You know, we're foreigners. And, and Paul told us that strangers, but God, and that makes a difference. Amen. Paul concludes the first half of Ephesians, just as he began it in Ephesians 1, 3 to 21, employing the language of prayer and praise. He exalts in God's power, present in the lives of believers through Christ and the Spirit. How can we, as Ellen G. White wrote above, better experience this power in our lives? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we have to... Trust in God, his word, the experiences of others, the testimonies of others. We have to have faith in what God has done in the lives of others and what he declares in his word. And uh, when we surrender to him, the power of God will transform our lives. Sometimes we will be amazed at the impact that it makes on our lives. But the more we stay in that relationship with God, the more we see the power of God manifested in our lives. Yes, there are times when we let go, but it's not God that has let us go. And when we fail, it's like we get stagnant. We're not moving forward. We're not getting stronger. But when we overcome the obstacles, each obstacle makes us stronger than what we were before. It's just like going through a storm. The tree that, that makes it through the storm gets stronger. And so oftentimes that's what the Christian's journey is like. As we stay connected to God, we experience more and more of the power of God in our lives to overcome the challenges that are there. So in this present life, every single believer can experience the power of God. Praise God. Again, Dr. Nose, we want to thank you for sharing with us this morning. However, I know that there is some pressing point that you want to leave with all of us here on Whispering Hope. So I'm going to give you that opportunity to give us your takeaways from today's lesson. Well, I just want to say I love God. I just want to praise him, magnify him. This is what Paul was really emphasizing here, the power of the gospel. And Paul said, it is worthwhile to suffer for. If God could have loved me so much and love you, the Gentiles, so much when he spoke to the Ephesians, I am willing to suffer. 
God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die in his place. So I just love God. I just want to magnify his name, praise him, live for him. And I hope and trust that you would do the same, each one listening, that you would have that deep love for God that when you get up in the morning, you can't sleep, make it a praise party, a praise moment. Lord, I can't sleep, but I got you. And I know you got me. And just, just give God thanks. There's so much in our lives to give God thanks for. And that's what I'm taking away from today's lesson, that the good news of the gospel brings us something to shout about, about the goodness and the love of God. Amen. You know, for closing, I want to go back to Paul's Damascus Road encounter. I think once we go there, we kind of get the understanding of his passion, why he spoke to the Ephesians such way. Not only the Ephesians, but the Corinthians and all of the blessings that he wrote. Particularly, can you imagine, Dr. Knows, that this man was an emissary for the church, his church, and they were about destroying this fledgling new Christian religion. We don't want it. And mm -hmm. so he got the mandates from the chief priests, from the high priest, and anywhere he found them, he was going to kill them. You know, but he was sincere in what he was doing. He assumed he was strongly convinced that he was doing the work of God. However, God recognized in him talents and skills and abilities that he could use for this new church that was being raised up. And so while he was on his way following this new church members, the new leaders, God struck him down. And it was just amazing that sometimes the things God has to do to get our attention. Mm. And here Paul wrapped up. Who is he seeing when everybody else is locked out from him? That bright light is Jesus himself. And God asks him, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And transformation happened immediately. Amen. And so this morning, some one of you may be on your road to Damascus, on your way to that Damascus road encounter where God is about to address you and ask you the pertinent question. Why are you harming me? Why are you not loving me? You see, God has done everything possible to save all of us. And so Dr. Knowles, this morning, I want you to pray because we know that there are lots of people watching us here. Many are not seven-day Adventists and they're coming through the truth from this ministry and some are still not sure, should I go all the way? Like Paul, they're holding on to their own concept as to what God requires of them. But once you've had that encounter, God does the transformation. And so Dr. Northern was going to invite you now just to pray that for us to hold on who are actually walking this walk and to be an inspiration to let the Holy Spirit move in the lives of others who are struggling to take this journey of Christianity. Let us pray. Father God, we just want to thank you for being an awesome God, a God who loves us infinitely. And sometimes we we worry, we stress, and your word declares, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? Something we imagine so many useless things. But you have shown over and over again that even the heathen that rages against God, they too can be saved. And if there's someone here on the platform who is struggling with their faith, I pray to God that you would help them to see how much you love them. Bring them to the understanding that there's nothing that they can do that will cause you not to love them. You hate their sin, but you love them more than they could ever imagine. So forgive, cleanse, empower, fill with the Holy Spirit, all of us here listening and participating. And may we have the assurance in Christ that no matter what, you have the capacity to move us to the next level in our walk with you. Be with us and bless us and grant us your amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Dr. Knowles, we want to thank you for being here with us on a Friday morning. We appreciate the, the depth of knowledge you bring here. And we just appreciate you being here with us. We ask God to continue to bless your ministry, to build your family, to enlarge your territory, to bring you success wherever you go. And so on behalf of Whispering Hope, we just want to say thank you for being here with us. And to all of our loyal viewers, 
Thank you for making Whispering Hope your choice. We appreciate your comments. We appreciate your questions. We ask you to continue to like and share these videos as we study God's words together. We want to invite you back this evening at 6.30 to ask your pastor series with Pastor Orville Joseph, followed by Inverse, the Young Adult Lesson Study, at 7, and tomorrow morning at 7.15, where we look at the Sabbath School Review for the upcoming week. And so we just want to say God bless, and see you guys later on Whispering Hope.